Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, because this morning I'd like to talk to you about God's pathway for usefulness. Usefulness. Remember, we were designed by God, called by God, redeemed by God to be his special tools, vessels. In fact, uh, uh, Paul calls us vessels uh, that, are, that are useful in the master's hands. That We are a tool, we are an instrument he uses. Now we know that. What's the pathway to be useful? I, I know we were made for, for his purposes, but how do we actually make sure that we are constantly doing and achieving and accomplishing what he wants us to do? That's down deep in most of our minds. In fact, uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, I talked to him uh, about a month or six weeks ago, and he was getting ready for some major surgery, and, and he asked me, he said, do you think... Do you think that I have done anything for the Lord with my life? And I looked at this dear saint and I said, what did you just say? And he said, do you think that my life has counted? Did you know down deep, especially if you get sick or as you're getting older or as you find limitations, we start asking ourselves that. Well, do you know how to know for sure? Follow God's pathway. He has a pathway. When we follow that, we're always useful. I'll just point it out to you before we read it. The first four verses talk about Isaiah. The way God used him was he had to, first of all, see God's holiness. And and as you heard this morning, as we worship God, Jeff said that that the reason missions exist is because worship doesn't. That's, That's because God wants us worshiping him, and when we worship him, We do whatever he wants us to do. And Isaiah had to fall and bow and totally come before the Lord's holiness and say, you are God and you are my God and I want to, I want to bow before your holiness and serve you. That's the first step and we'll, we'll examine that. Then when he did that, look at verse five, he started seeing how bad he was. You know, you get around the light and you start seeing all the dust and you start seeing all the, 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 the things that need to be removed from our lives. In bright light, you see the lint. In holiness, you see the sin. And, and when Isaiah bowed before the Lord's holiness, he realized his sinfulness. You know what God can use? Someone that realizes how holy God is and how sinful we are, because then we're like Paul. We say, apart from you, we can't do anything. We are those who are weak, so you can be strong. So Isaiah, the pathway is, remember God's majesty and holiness, realize my sinfulness. Then in verses 6 and 7, receive God's cleansing. We should be decreasingly responding to sin and increasingly responding to the Spirit of God. We should be decreasingly defiling ourselves with things that grieve and quench the Holy Spirit, and we should be increasingly responsive and yielded to the Holy Spirit. And that's what God's cleansing is all about. A decreasing frequency of sin, an increasing frequency of righteousness lived out by the power of the Spirit of God through us. And then... Verse six, or I mean verse eight is wonderful. Once a person sees God's holiness and realizes their sinfulness and, and receives his cleansing, look what happens. God starts directing them. And the Lord says, who's going to go for us? The Trinity of God, the triunity. We, we start understanding God's calling. You know, you can't fully understand God's calling to understand he is awesome and holy and we're not. And so we need his cleansing and presence and power. And as soon as we get in that wonderful place, God says, this is what I want you to do. So if you're at all wondering how to be useful, then track with Isaiah this morning as we look at his life. God left us here to serve him, and the key to that serving is being useful. In fact, when I look at, at, at our children, we were having a big uh, uh, lunch yesterday and talking to the kids, and I was talking to them about being useful to God. You know, that's the greatest thing in life. The bottom line of your children as they're growing is not whether they're the summa and magna and the whatever cum laude. It's are they useful to God? Because everything else is going to be destroyed. Everything else doesn't matter. Everything else is going to burn up except for being God's servants and being useful. So the key to life is usefulness to God. And Isaiah 6 makes us think about the balance sheet of our life. 
It always reminds me of what one of my great missionary heroes said at the end of his life. He was laying there dying on his deathbed, and he said, only one life. Do you all know his saying? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ, what, will last. He said that in the heart of Africa. He said that and expressed to his children that he had given his life for Christ. The balance sheet of our life is all about usefulness, and the pathway to usefulness, God had to lead his servant Isaiah. See, Isaiah was in the epicenter. If you know anything about Isaiah, he lived in Jerusalem. He was around it all. He knew it all. But God says, to be useful to me, you don't just know this, you've got to experience it. And you've got to respond. This means the most important measure of life to us today is how much of today was useful to God. The only enduring part of my life will be those parts that are attached to serving God. Now, there can be a lot of stuff in life, as we saw Sunday night, that we do that aren't sin. But they're not attached to God. And God is going to burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. Every part of your life and my life that wasn't attached to him. And so the more we grow in sanctification, the more parts of our life get attached to God. And they are involved at his beckoning, at his leading for us to serve him with those parts of our life. Just about everybody who goes to a Bible teaching church like Calvary or all the other ones that surround us in this country and around the world, we know that, that what our dear missionary referred to this morning, the Great Commission, right? We all know that. It's the last three verses of Matthew 28. But you don't even have to turn there because we all know, and, and we even heard it recited this morning, that we're supposed to go into all the world. And so most people know we're supposed to be doing something. And most believers down deep want to do that. But as we try, we realize every day that we want to serve the Lord is an uphill climb going against the tide. It's like everything militates. We decide we're going to read our Bible, everything interrupts. You know, the car won't start and we have flat tire and the, you know, the windshield wipers are broken or we're low on gas and we have to rush off early to work because we have to, and, or we, it snowed so much we have to spend extra time. And all that planning we had to start our day with the Lord just evaporates. Or we try and speak for Him and, and we get interrupted. It's just like everything goes against us serving the Lord. So it comes down to, we're, we know we're here to do what he called and designed and left us to do, which is proclaim the gospel. But 95% or more of all believers find that outreach and missions and evangelism is at the best hard, but in actuality for most of us undone. So this morning what we don't need is one more message to make us feel guilty about not reaching out to the world. Because I don't believe guilt is a proper motivator. I believe that all of us down deep want to be useful. Down deep, we want to evangelize. We're we're not sure if we can. And we want to reach out and do outreach, but, but we don't quite see the pathway. Well, the pathway is not revving up and pushing them out the door and making them do it. The pathway is the pathway that God took Isaiah down. Did you know I relate to Isaiah? Isaiah was very much around the things of God. But he just didn't know how he could do what God was calling him to do. So God showed him. And what God did is God consecrated him. And from this passage in the Old Testament, we find our unchanging, immutable God has the same plan in the Old and the New Testament. Did you realize that? God has the same methodology in both the Old and the New Testament. God wants servants who are consecrated, who see his holiness, and when they see his holiness, they realize their own weakness and frailty and sinfulness, and so they come for his strength and his cleansing. And in that moment, as he cleanses us and fills us, he directs us what he wants us to do. And that pathway hasn't changed in the Old or the New Testament. God is interested more than in anything you do. He's interested in who you are. And the key to usefulness in life and the pathway to usefulness is doing what God designed us to do, but the way that God designed it to happen. 
And let's, as we track through Isaiah 6, let's listen to his voice as God tells us through Isaiah the story of Isaiah's call, of Isaiah's preparation, and then, in the end, how Isaiah became useful to God. And we're going to read the whole chapter. Okay, so let's stand together with Isaiah 6 in front of you and listen to these words, and I will remind you after each section, because when we get all done reading, I'm going to say it enough times that maybe you should even write in your Bible so every time you see Isaiah 6, you will think of the pathway God laid out for Isaiah. Then you'll back up and say, and that's a pathway I should be following every day. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, this is Isaiah talking, saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, here's that great hymn we all know that Reginald Heber wrote, but here's where he got it from. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the posts of the doors were shaken. So first, Isaiah got a sight, got a picture, got a refreshing reminder of God's holiness. And as the posts of the door were shaken, in verse 4, by the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Isaiah testifies, woe is me, in verse 5. I am undone. It means I am disintegrating. He's just falling apart before the holiness of God. Because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He realized his own sinfulness, his weakness, his failings, his need of the Lord. Verse 6, so as soon as he realized his sinfulness, one of the seraphim, verse 6, By the way, seraphim means a burning one. It's beautiful. Just think of a creature that burns, just like flying fire. So one of these flying fires, a seraph, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he'd taken with the tongs from the altar. See the connection to the sacrifice? The altar where the fire was always burning? Speaking of Christ's sacrifice, as it was portrayed in all those countless sacrifices on that altar. So coming from the place of sacrifice, the place of the altar, he came with tongs and a live burning coal, and he touched my mouth with it. See the application of the work of Christ, of his sacrifice. That's the wonderful work, the cleansing work of Christ. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. You know, the best way to serve God is to know that everything is taken. I am totally forgiven. And we have such a joy and such a peace and such a, a wonder. Experience that cleansing. Now verse 8. So I heard a voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And look what Isaiah does. Because of of this process, this pathway, he says, Here am I, send me. I want to do whatever you want. He didn't even know exactly what he wanted him to do. He just said, I'm going to do it. In verse 9, he said, Go and tell this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. He said, you're going to have a dull audience. Verse 10, make the hearts of this people dull, their ears heavy, their eyes shut, and they will see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Verse 11, so Isaiah said, Lord, how long am I supposed to do this? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away, and forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for a consuming as a terebinth tree, as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed will be a stump. You know basically what he said? Keep doing this until the end. Doesn't matter what happens. Stay faithful to the end. See God's holiness, see your sinfulness, receive his cleansing, hear his call, and keep doing it to the end. What a simple pathway. Let's bow before the Lord. I pray this morning, O Lord, that we will experience 
through your servant Isaiah, through your inspired word, through this record that you left for us, this beautiful picture of the pathway to usefulness. And that pathway is a pathway of consecration. And I pray that if anything marks our lives in the year 2010, it will be marked down in our lives as a year that we were consecrated for our master's use. And that we all realized we're servants, we're slaves to God. And the best slave, the most useful slave, is a consecrated slave, a tool that is fit for the master's use. May every tool that you hold in this room this morning be a consecrated tool fit for your use. Oh Lord, we want to be useful. And we yield ourselves. Open our eyes to your word this morning. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God's desire, simply stated for each of us, is consecration. He wants us consecrated. He wants us, as I said earlier, with more and more pieces of our life attached to him. That's what consecration is about. Attaching my life to the Lord. And any part of my life that won't attach to him, ditch it. Get rid of it. You're going to have to anyway. Either he's going to pry it out of your hands at death, or you're going to ditch it now and connect everything possible in your life to the Lord. You want to know what's worth living for? It's what's worth something to God. That's what consecration is all about. God's desire for each of us is consecration. And there are stages that are keys to usefulness to God. There is a pathway for each of us who God wants us to follow and we want to follow every day, every month, for all of our lives. We want to follow that pathway, that pathway that Isaiah portrays for us for lifelong usefulness to God. Here are the stages if, if you want to mark them in your Bible. The, the first four verses talk about remembering God's holiness. Now I want to go into that with you in depth, but Isaiah 6, 1 to 4 talks about, first of all, God wants you and me to remember his holiness. Then after that, he wants to realize our sinfulness. And by the way, the closer we get to the Lord, the more we are aware of our sinfulness. That's why Paul, we know, was so close to the Lord. What did he say about himself? Not that I'm a bad sinner. He said, I am the what of sinners? Chiefest. You really think he did more sins than anybody else? No. No. He was just more aware of them than anybody else because he was so close to the Lord. And we find that similar theme throughout the scriptures of all God's great servants. So we remember God's holiness, we realize our sinfulness, we receive his cleansing, and then we respond to his call, and then we remain faithful. Now I want you to trace these with me in in the Bible because I want you to see that this... This reminder, this simple truth, has been repeatedly taught and explained to God's servants for 2,700 years. This sixth chapter has been around for 2,700 years. Do you realize we have been preceded by 27 centuries of God's people who have heard and seen and responded to this truth? I mean, it didn't just show up yesterday. This is an old path, like Jeremiah called it. And this is a wonderful path that God has given for us. First, to be useful to God, we must always remember God's holiness. That's the first four verses. The Bible says God by nature is holy. In fact, it says he is separate from sin. God is separate from sin. Hebrews describes Jesus as holy, harmless, undefiled, made separate from sin. But he became sin for us. But God by nature is holy, sinless, flawless, and pure. So no matter how compassionate God is, remember this, God's attributes, God's attributes, we must not get them out of balance. No matter how compassionate you think God is, and he is very compassionate, he never lessens his holiness. And that's something, that balance we need to see. The church has gone through centuries of kind of a pendular swing between law 
and grace. And kind of like the, the Puritan years where everybody, uh, you know, wore dark clothes and tried to be real sober and not do anything, there was this extreme emphasis on the holiness and righteousness of God. And it seems like in the last few decades, we've had the pendulum swing over here where there was a great debate in Christianity whether or not Christians uh, could be called a Christian if they never ever repented of their sins, if they never responded to God's holiness. And so this pendular swing between grace and almost liberty and almost license to holiness and, and the righteousness of God and almost thinking that, that we have to be perfect to attain righteousness, that pendular swing goes back and forth. But to solve it, think of this. No matter how compassionate God is, no matter how full of grace, no matter how overflowing with mercy, God is eternally holy. Holy, holy. So the key is to be near him. We must be clothed with Christ's righteousness and have no known, unconfessed, unforsaken sin. doesn't mean we're perfect. It means we're not conscious of holding on to and being unwilling to repent of anything his holiness points out in our life. That's the key. Not being perfect, but being repentant, being contrite, being consecrated. God is still holy, and in the realm of eternity, around the throne, at the center of the universe, there is one word that is repeated regularly over and over again. Do you remember when we get to the book of Revelation, we get to 4 and 5 and 7 and 11 and 16? Do you know what? Over and over and over, they're saying, chanting, it's right here. Look, look in Isaiah chapter 6. Look what it says in verse 3. This is what the, the, the language of heaven is. Holy, holy, holy is our God. For many of us, just saying or hearing those words begins a song playing in our hearts and minds. You know that song? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. What does it say? Early in the morning. My song will rise to thee. Did you know that's the first key on the pathway to usefulness to God is recognizing his holiness? To to help you, I want you to take your hymn books now. Sit your Bible down for a second. Get number 262. Because I thought we would go to heaven for just a moment this morning. Wouldn't you like to just go to heaven for one moment this morning? That's what Paul did. Remember the Lord took him up there and he couldn't even talk about it. It was so wonderful. Everybody would want to have left the church and gone to heaven. It was so exciting. But hymn number 262 is based on Isaiah 6. So what I thought we'd do is something very unorthodox. I mean, you're used to In fact, some people have already settled in for their morning nap, and we're going to shake them up. Now that you have that, let's stand up, okay? Now watch out, the people around you. Shake a couple of them. I see them. 262 is what we're going to be doing in heaven. Only we won't have the hymn books. But we'll have the same God. And I want you, without the instruments, with just our voices, we're actually going to try and sing on Sunday morning without <clears throat> John. Oh, oh, where is that? Hmm. Come on, don't let me down. You know, the, you can read music. I can't. Here we go. We're going to sing the first and second stanza of this and see how we do, okay? You all know this? If you don't, say yes. Okay, let's sing it to the Lord. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The second stanza is where we're going to be. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, 
casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who which worth and are and evermore shall be. Now that's heaven. Let's sit down and come back to earth. Okay. We're going to use that hymn book once more. Don't put it too far away. The first key to usefulness for eternity is remembering God's holiness. Now, I want you to remember that, okay? So to help you, to aid in that, I remember when I used to be in classes, and and especially in graduate school, where you work all night, and you try and go to classes, and you're doing papers all the time, the teachers would, would do something to help us remember, you know? They did all kinds of things. And one of the things they do is, when they get all done, they'd say, now, did you hear what I said? Repeat that for me. Remember God's holiness. Now, I want you, in your heart, to remember this. Everything in your life not attached to God is useless. It might be nice, it might not be sin. It's useless if it's not attached to God. You know, you can even attach something that some people think is useless as outdoor things to God. You know, I recently, I, I'm a bookworm, not really an outdoor person. But there was this man in this church that persistently for a whole year kept saying, you need to come to my farm, you need to come to my farm, you need to go hunting with me, you need to go hunting. And I thought, I don't want to get cold, I don't want to get wet. I remember that as a little boy. I don't want to get burrs, you know, and, and I don't want to have my feet wet and my shoes wet and my socks wet and sit and shiver like I used to with my dad. I don't want to go. And he kept persisting, so finally I went. And when I got to his farm, in the cement of his barn, it says Psalm 96, and he said, The outdoors is just a larger arena, cathedral for us to worship our God. And all those, there was a whole group of us that came to hunt with him. He made us all stand in a circle. We all put our arms on each other's shoulders, all these men in their wonderful outfits. And with that verse under our feet, right in the cement of his barn, he prayed one of the most beautiful prayers that we wouldn't just be out there hunting. But this is what he prayed. He said, I pray that these young men hunting here will be future deacons and elders and pastors and missionaries and that they will worship the God who made this universe. You know what he did? He attached something he loves to God. He made it very useful to God. And I bet that those that were there at that weekend hunt will never forget the fire and the challenge and the Lord and the stars and the outdoors, it became a cathedral. Did you know you can attach any part of your life that's yielded to the Lord to him and it will be useful? Remember God's holiness. Remember anything unattached to him is not worth anything. Think about his holy presence. Think about standing before his throne. Think about falling on your face before him. That leads us to the second part. Look at verse 5. Because secondly, not only... Do we remember God's holiness? But in Isaiah 6, 5, to be useful to God, I must realize my sinfulness. I must realize how much I need his gracious, forgiving, cleansing touch. And do you see, if you think about what you've read in Revelation, what are the saints in heaven saying over and over and over? Worthy is a lamb that was what? Yeah, slain. What was he slain for? He gave himself for my sin. I realize that I'm in need of salvation. Did you know that's what makes Christians so humble? We know we're sinners. We know that we're lost before Christ found us. We know that we are hopeless and helpless without him. That that makes us so humble. We don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think because we realize in God's presence how, how unworthy we are, how undeserving we are. And that's what Isaiah had to go through. By the way, Isaiah was from the upper echelon. He was an aristocrat. If you know anything about him, he was from the royal family. He was, he was steeped in, in the finest that Israel had. And he lived in, in the palaces of Israel. He was a court prophet. 
And, you know, sometimes when everything's going nice and smells nice and is nice around us, we think we're nice. And we don't realize we're desperately evil. And that that we are born for trouble like sparks fly upward. And and that every imagination of our heart is only evil continually apart from God's grace. And we don't realize that until we see God's holiness. And we start realizing our sinfulness. The closer we get to the light, the more our sinfulness we can see. When Job came to understand the almighty El Shaddai, he confessed in Job 42, verses 5 and 6, that I am undone. He says, I am undone. He says the same thing that Isaiah did. He said, I repent in dust and ashes. You look at that sometime, the last chapter of the book of Job. When Job saw the wonder of God, he was overwhelmed, and he collapsed before God, and he says, I repent in dust and ashes. He realized his sinfulness. That's something we all need to do. We all need to be smitten with our utter unworthiness, Because the Lord says, to whom much is forgiven, the same what? Loves much. You want to increase your love for the Lord? Realize how forgiven you are. Realize if God should mark iniquity, no one could stand, because we all sin. In the New Testament, when the apostle Peter saw the power of God the Son in Luke chapter 5, it's a wonderful story sometime, read it in Luke 5, 8. Jesus uh, was standing there, and Peter was fishing, and nothing was happening. Jesus said, throw your net on the other side. And Peter, oh, he says, Lord, done this all night. What are you talking about, throw it on the other side? There aren't any fish here. But because you told me to, I will. And he put the net on the other side, and the boat went like this. What the Lord did is he redirected every fish in the whole sea into his net. You know, he can do that. That's better than a fish finder, I'll tell you that. You want a fish, pray, you know. But the Lord directed all the fish into that net. And you know what happened? Peter just, he, he just forgot the fish, and it says he fell on his knees. And he said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You see, as soon as we see God's holiness, we realize our sinfulness. And in that moment, that's when God has our attention and can use us most. We realize How much I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. I need your cleansing. I need your power. I need your forgiveness. I need you who have forgotten my sin to to give me the joy of my salvation. I mean, you can think of all the scriptures that can fit in there. Another one, the Apostle John. Do you remember in Revelation 1.17? When he saw Jesus in his full, ascended and glorified condition as God the Son in eternity. When he saw him, when Jesus came to visit him on the Isle of Patmos on one Sunday near the end of the first century, do you remember what happened to John when he saw Jesus? It says he fell down on the ground and became like a dead man. That means he was stiff and couldn't move. I mean, he could hardly even breathe. He was just laying down there like he was dead. Do you know why? He saw God's holiness and he realized his sinfulness. Because we're not God, we're not perfect. We sin regularly, daily, moment by moment. We fall short of God's glory. Every part of our life that's short of God's glory, we are aware of when we see his holiness. The theme of those who stand around the throne is that Jesus is the lamb who was slain. The lamb who was slain for their sin, for my sin. As Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Listen, here's the best part. Who loved me and gave himself for me. The message of the useful servants is, he gave himself for me, for my sins. I need his cleansing. That theme is so much in our hearts because the closer we are to God's holiness, the more I realize my own personal sinfulness. Again, the testimony of saints who have walked this path before us help us frame fitting words to express our need of our redeeming lamb. If you just take your hymn books, and you aren't going to have to stand up for this one, look at number 196. Because if you know anything about the name at the bottom of the page on the left side, William Cowper, William Cowper was one of the most melancholic, depressed men of the 18th century. 
Uh, I was in Scotland uh, uh, last, or the year before, I don't remember when I was in Scotland, about a year ago, but I, I was shown a collection of the works of William Cowper. He wrote volumes of poems. He, was, he just wrote and wrote and wrote. But personally, he was so depressed. And, and his friends were uh, the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield. I mean, how would you like to have friends like that? And, and, and he struggled with his own sinfulness. And the only way he could find any peace is to write poems about being forgiven because he was so acutely aware of his sin. And this, number 196, is one of his poems that, that helped him overcome his despair at his own sinfulness. Now, God's purpose is not for us to despair, and he doesn't want us to, to be down you know, in the pits all the time and just moaning how horrible we are. What he wants us to do is to be like those in Revelation 4 and 5 and saying, you have forgiven so much, I love you so much. So I want you to try out with me. You probably don't even need the hymn books for this. This is, this is one of my all-time favorite communion hymns because this talks about the essence of salvation that we are forgiven. And when God forgives us, we have a new beginning. And that means every time we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to give us a new beginning, to give us a new cleansing, to give us a fresh new start. It's not just once a year we go to the Ganges and shave and bathe ourselves in that filthy water like the Hindus. It's not just every time we get up to Salt Lake City and go in and have some kind of secret ceremony like the Mormons do. It's not every time we go out on Saturdays you know, and pass out a few tracts like the Jehovah's Witnesses do. No, no. Every moment the new covenant gives us a new beginning. And William Cowper captures that. And I thought the first two stanzas would be a great way for us to thank the Lord for his cleansing us. Because the pathway to usefulness is see how holy God is and then to thank him for how much he's cleansed us. Okay? Let's try this to the Lord seated there. And if you know it, just close your eyes and lift your head to the Lord. If you don't know it, follow the words. Here we go. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood. All their guilty stains. Second stanza. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. And the more you realize you're forgiven, the more you love. And back to Isaiah chapter 6, the more that we receive God's cleansing, the more useful we become because we are humble believers. We readily confess our complete cleansing that the gracious work of Christ accomplished. And once we're assured of that cleansing, then we want to tell others about it. It's just like when, when someone finds something that works, they tell people about it. They say, wow, this diet works, or wow, you know, this tool works, or wow, I just found this, you know, that 
fixes my car, whatever, we just want to talk about it. How about what fixes your soul? We want to talk about it. And, and Isaiah received that cleansing. And he knew that though he was deeply stained like crimson, remember Isaiah 1, he was white as snow. Though his sins were like scarlet, he said that they would be white like wool. That truth makes us full of hope. We well up with the joy of the Spirit. We're kept by His peace. And to the end of our lives, whether in weakness or sickness or even in dementia, as the great hymn writer John Newton suffered the last years of his life, we can confidently express our conviction that though we were great sinners, Jesus is a great Savior. See, that's what we're going to sing forever. We're going to sing forever our testimony. Do you all know John Newton's testimony? You know, some people have trouble uh, giving their testimony. In fact, there, there are a lot of people that are afraid to stand behind that screen and be baptized because they don't want to talk out loud. But do you know what you can do? You can give your testimony with John Newton's testimony. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? Wretch like me. I once was what? Lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. See, you all have a testimony if you're saved. And we can all say that. And when we do that, we acknowledge his cleansing. Fourthly, if you're looking at Isaiah 6, look at verse 8. Because Isaiah learned that usefulness to God, not only meant seeing his holiness, realizing his sinfulness, and receiving his cleansing, but he recognized God's call. And that's what happens in verse 8. He recognized and responded to God's call. Remember when we started, most of us have heard the Great Commission, but few of us have surrendered to it. God says, my usefulness is tied in response to his call. God wants me offering my life back to him. He wants me to be his servant. Do you see what Isaiah said in verse 8? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And in the New Testament, it's Jesus' voice saying, go into all the world. And and." Share the gospel with every creature and baptize those that respond and become disciples in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you know the Lord is still saying what verse 8 says. Who? Who can I send to do that? Who will go for us? Do you know what made Isaiah respond? Because he was so overwhelmed by God's holiness, so painfully aware of his own sinfulness, but so grateful for his cleansing that he responds to God's call. Now, Isaiah was saved, if you want to know. I mean, this isn't his salvation. This is his consecration. This is the pathway we have to go through to get tuned back up for why we're here. If you really want a spiritual revitalization, meditate long on God's holiness. You'll see your own sinfulness, and I'll see mine. And then we just thank the Lord for our cleansing we've received. And then we start hearing his voice saying, are you going to do what I left you to do? Are you going to be useful to me? And we say, yes. I want every part of my life attached to you. I want to be useful. By the way, a servant is simply one who does the will of another. God's servant do his will. God has expressed his will through his word and in his church. And we gather to encourage one another to do that will. This morning... Isaiah 6 is a pathway to usefulness. Have you stopped your life and turned off all the sounds and all the flashing lights and everything? In this new year, have you focused on God's holiness? I don't mean here singing with us, holy, holy. I mean you alone with his word. Have you become painfully aware of your own sinfulness? Has the light increased? And when you see that, have you said, cleanse me, I repent, And I want a decreasing frequency of those sins in my life. And I want an increasing response to your holiness. When you come to that point, that's the point of most availability. All you have to do is look back at verse 8, say to the Lord, Here am I. Send me. Use me. Live through me. Let every part of my life be attached to you. I don't want to waste it. Now, this morning is only an introduction to what the New Testament teaches us. We need 
in our lives to be ultimately useful to God. And this year, for at least six months, we're going to be studying the curriculum that flows from this consecration. It's in the book of Titus, chapter 2. And it talks about older men, it talks about older women, it talks about younger women, younger men, and even has a section on people that are employed, what God's qualifications are for you to be the best employee and servant to your job that you do. And we're going to study that all year long, but the best preparation for it is sometime today, sometime this week, make it a habit in your devotional time. Stay with it till you see how holy God is. Bow before him, realizing how unholy we are. Ask for his cleansing and taking over your life. And then say, I'm your servant, Lord. What do you want me to do? Let's stand before him. And I'm going to close in prayer. And as I close in prayer, why don't you, in your heart, pray and say, Lord, don't let me merely hear this. Lord, I want to do this. Lord, I want to get in the habit of seeing your holiness, remembering how holy you are, reminding me how how much I need you. I want to receive and bask in the new beginning of your cleansing. And then I just want to offer myself every day, every moment as your servant. Let's bow together. Father, speak to our hearts. I've spoken to ears. Your spirit speaks to hearts. Your word changes hearts. Our lives are attached to what we desire in our hearts. I pray that the desire of every one of your servants here this morning would be to say to you, here I am. What do you want me to do for you? How can I most fully attach my life? How can I follow this pathway to be useful to you. And then, Lord, you will show each of us the pathway you have for us to fulfill your purpose. And I thank you and praise you, holy God, for your great cleansing and call. Consecrate us to that end, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus and all God's servants said, amen. God bless you. You should go.